After what appeared to be a pretty convincing breakdown on the Thursday session here, markets actually closed back inside of the overhead balance range on Friday, with of course the help of Apple earnings, continuing to just disappoint anybody looking for anything more than just a day trade. As always, in today's episode, we will be looking at all of the relevant data points for the upcoming week's worth of trade and assessing all of the red flags to see if they've resolved in the positive or negative direction. Check out any of the links that we have listed down below in the description, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel, and make sure you stay tuned until the end of today's episode. I've got four additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So kicking things off on the SPY weekly timeframe, talking about candle structure and location as we always do. For structure and location, we have nearly an identical analysis to the previous weekly video. The only difference, of course, is that we're dealing with a red bodied hammer. So nonetheless, the buyers still step up in the lower wick of the bar, and we are able to close in the upper third of the weekly range, but we're unable to recapture the opening print, and we're unable to close literally on the highs of the weekly range. Nonetheless, buyers still remain in control based on that lower wick. If we think about location on the bar to bar count, we did produce an equal low and for all intents and purposes, a very nuanced, slightly higher high, maybe a slight bullish edge, but I would really start to think of that as more of a neutral data point. What's a little bit more convincing from a location perspective is that the lower wicks continue to respect the top of the banking crisis candle high. Because of that, once again, I would say that the buyers have a little bit more of an edge here. If we're thinking about trend count on the weekly time frame chart, we have lows, higher lows, higher lows, and both of these lower wicks can start to be thought of as the next set of weekly higher lows. In terms of tracking the highs, we have highs, higher highs, and now equal highs. If we get a break here, that of course would constitute an ascending triangle breakout, and perhaps the next weekly target could be this pivot high, much closer to SPY 430. If we start to consider the anchored view apps, I would just remind you that the all-time high anchored view app from back here continues to act as support in the lower wicks of these bars. And if we throw on the volume profile, I just wanna make this nuanced point once again. We talked about it in last week's episode, but there are two high, high volume nodes that the market could be drawn to. In both of the lower wicks, as those breakdowns were unfolding, we found ourselves in the low volume void. Remember that markets should be drawn to areas of high liquidity, so either here or back up here. And in both instances, the market did rotate. It was gravitating towards the upper high volume node. That does strike me as, once again, a more bullish than bearish data point. Now, it can act as resistance, but if this pattern breaks, once again, the thesis should be that this is really starting to build out a stronger bottom on the weekly time frame chart, and we should start to look at these overhead pivots on on the higher time frames. So on the daily time frame chart, let's first analyze the weekly expected move. If you're not familiar with this study, top right hand corner's got you covered with a brief tutorial. Overall, if we're contained by the upper edge of the expected move, it's implying a higher high being produced and of course a break of the balance area in the upward direction. The number is 419.54 and that does strike me as a bullish indication. If we're contained by the lower edge of the weekly expected move, the number is 405.75 and that would imply a higher low over the Thursday breakdown low and most importantly, it would keep us in the balance range that we have in front of us. So a little bit more neutral on the downside, but nonetheless, overall, more bullish than bearish here. From a trend perspective, I don't really think it's fair to say that we're dealing with any particular trend on the daily time frame as we just remain in this balance box. Technically, from here to here, we have a higher high, but from here to here, we have a lower low. Now, an equal low was technically produced. There's an opportunity for a lower high, but we certainly don't have that data point in hand. We don't really have a rejection yet of this 413 level. So I do think that the trend remains neutral on the daily time frame chart. From a pattern perspective, we're of course dealing with yet again a look below and fail. So if this is the balance range we've already seen once, look below, fail, we targeted the top of the range, that trade was complete, and now we have yet again a look below. Is this failure going to rotate all the way to the top? We are yet to ultimately see that, but of course it does have more bullish than bearish implications. I also want to talk about the gaps from both the Thursday and Friday session because let's not forget, although it's easy to focus on the green bodied bar here, the buyers did not have any sort of attempt to close the overhead gap on the Thursday session. And then Apple earnings, of course, are the catalyst that give us the gap in the first place, paired with the really solid job numbers on Friday morning that 
you know, they produce a gap up. And once again, do the sellers respond by trying to close the gap underneath us? Absolutely not. There's hardly any lower wick on the Friday bar here. So the sellers do seem to be, based on this evidence in front of us, a little bit weaker on the Friday session specifically. If we take a look at the hourly time frame chart, this is where things start to get a little bit more nuanced. And I really like uh, the way we can think about this chart. So let's not forget on the daily time frame chart, things become much more meaningful when and if we get a break and higher low above the top of balance or a break. And of course, the proof with a lower high underneath the bottom of balance. That goes without saying. But for you nuanced day traders out there, let's take a look at 41035. We know that this was the breakdown point from right over here. We know that on the first attempt to break the balance in the downward direction, there was no reattempt at a lower high here, no reattempt at a lower high here, no reattempt at a lower high here. This time around, notice on the recapture back inside of the daily balance range, there's still no reattempt at a lower high here. And as a matter of fact, it actually produces a higher low on the intraday session on Friday above 410.35. That does strike me as a very nuanced but more bullish than bearish data point. The other thing that's going on here on the hourly time frame chart is if the bears were going to remain in control, we would have highs, lower highs, and lower highs would have been produced here to keep us in an hourly downtrend. Obviously, from here to here, we certainly are dealing with equal highs. So once again, the trend is fairly neutral at this point in time. If we take out our Fibonacci's, this is an interesting uh, little data point as well. Coming from the top of the breakdown bar from Tuesday to the low of the Thursday session, notice that 410.35 is also our 61.8. And what do we say about 61.8? As long as we can start closing bars on any time frame above that 61.8, the odds generally improve to make the full 100% retracement. If you just want to build the fact that we have confluence of areas, the 61.8 is 410.35 is the higher low from Friday. That's going to be your key watch as we move into the early stages of the coming week's worth of trade. So what do we have for scenarios here? Of course, the bulls want to look for an hourly continuation move over 413 to target the top of the daily balance at 416.75, or the bulls can also afford a retest and higher low above 410.35 and then look for the equal high break here and then see that continuation. Of course, that would then imply that the bears want two things. Number one would just be a pure breakdown of 410.35. Lower highs underneath are interesting for the gap to close from the Friday session. Or the flip side of this coin is fine. Give the bulls their rotation to the top of the daily range and then look for rejections off of the top at 416.75. So I wouldn't really say that there's an edge for the bears early on in the coming weeks worth of trade. You either need to see a failure underneath 410.35 or start to look for a rally first to bring us here and then a rejection off the top of the daily range at 416.75. Let's take a look at some supporting evidence. Market internals are always exhibit A. Check out the video tutorial on the top right hand corner if you're not familiar with this screen. For the most part, outflows were certainly the case on the week. They were right at the border of being significant. However, let's take a look at the Friday action here. Certainly significant inflows on that daily session in isolation well above positive 300 million. In the advanced decline line, what I want you to focus on here is the overcorrelated state that's achieved on the Tuesday breakdown and how that neutralizes on Wednesday and Thursday. So it would have seemed on first glance that the Thursday breakdown actually had some strength and some power behind it. It was not just an overblown move. The sellers were making progress in the downward direction. All of that is wiped away on Friday with the extremely bullish read. Now, the one consideration here is that this is massively overcorrelated. It was buy, 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 buy everything on the Friday session. So if there is a little bit of pullback, the key to watch here is to see if we can resolve this on per se Monday or Tuesday above the zero line in the advanced decliner. The next thing that I really want you to focus on is the fact that the cumulative build down here in the tick was sustained in the upward direction throughout the course of the day. What would that tell us about the activity on the Friday session? Well, don't get me wrong. In the first 30 minute bar here, 15 minute bar, this is certainly squeeze on the open. And we can see that the tick opens well above positive 1000. But the fact that this continues to build into the afternoon would indicate that, hey, as this unfolds here, new money buyers actually step up and push this up across the broad market. It's not just short squeeze that took place on the Friday session. So if we pair the fact that the tick represents new money buyers, that the volume was significant and we had an overcorrelated state, it would be ideal to look for those pullbacks we outlined in the SPY daily chart as a primary situation early on in the coming weeks worth of trade. The sellers will have an edge if they can undo this work by producing 
extremely negative advanced decline line impressions, likely down here in trend zone, or some sort of big outflows from the market well underneath negative 300 million in the first Monday and Tuesday session of the coming week's worth of trade. Cumulative tick obviously would want to build out negative, but for the most part, identifying that these buyers here do look more solid than just short squeeze buyers on the Friday session. Market profile is always exhibit B. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the tutorial in the top right hand corner. For the most part, I want to compare the nuances of Friday's session in relationship to the spike from the Thursday session. Recall that this spike is produced after Jerome Powell gets off the stage from the FOMC press conference. So there's some bearish momentum happening there into the close. It's really noteworthy that on the Thursday session, obviously the value area and point of control remain underneath the spike. There's no attempt to rotate through these single prints. And we traditionally think of single prints as an area of thin structure on the market profile. So Thursday, again, hats off to the bears. It was looking like a solid attempt in the downward direction. Unfortunately, with Apple earnings and the gap up on Friday, not only do we not close the gap, but look at how A period promptly recaptures all of the single prints from Wednesday, and the point of control technically closes above that single print border there, and the value area, of course, is overlapping to up as well. That does strike me as a bullish nuance, which would wipe away the consolidation from the Thursday session in particular. Now, the point of control did not migrate higher with price on the individual day from the Friday session, so that would sort of make me think that the pullback situation we described on the SPY hourly may be more likely, right? Technically, the fair price of Friday's session was lower, or I would say towards the midpoint of Friday's range in general. Another nuanced data point would be to just make sure that we stay above 4125. Otherwise, just like these single prints represent thin structure, so do these from A period. Staying above 4125 in your ES futures would be constructive in the upward direction for that pullback situation we just described on the SPY hourly. Now, if the SPY hourly breaks underneath 41035, if the ES Yes, obviously breaks underneath here with a lower high. It should be all eyes on the Thursday low because not only you can see that we have a poor low here with two TPOs across, but if we scrunch this up, we also remember that these are fairly equal lows on the daily time frame chart. So would it not make sense that longs have stop losses that are placed underneath these two equal lows? If we start to break down underneath that, you should really start to expect a bit of a stop run, aka a flush in the downward direction. Jumping back on over to the platform to evaluate the weekly performance of our sectors reveals that leading the pack was actually the XLK, the heaviest weighted tech sector, of course, that is a risk on indication for our market, but it's not really an impressive margin there, only up 0.35% on the week. And just underneath we have have utilities. So a mixed bag from a posture perspective at the top. And at the bottom, we see energy getting absolutely hammered down 4.56%, followed by financials. So just like we have a mixed bag at the top end of the range, we have a mixed bag posture wise at the bottom end of the range. Let's take a look through some of these structural charts and evaluate what's going on from a trend perspective. I'm really thrilled with the XLK being back up at the top of the balance range from here. And on the daily time frame chart, you could also make the argument that we have lows, higher lows, higher lows were just found on the Thursday breakdown and the bullish in goal for rotating back up towards the top of this range here would indicate to me that coming off of a higher low, we should be looking for equal high breaks over 150-150. Of course, for the broad market, that's a pretty bullish indication, especially noting that there's quite a lot of room to run overhead to the overhead gap 155.80 closes up towards 157.58. If we do see some sort of break, obviously your next stage would be to see a higher low above 151.50. If we come back down underneath, 150, 150. That's a red flag that certainly would be a look above and fail. Start to target the low from Thursday at 147.25. Heaviest weighted sector worth spending some time on. Let's take a look at utilities. Really respectful going sideways in this range. It's fine. It's no problem there. Energy breaking down aggressively this week. Obviously, the laggard there down 4.56%. As we know, this is a D for defensive sector. It doesn't really bother me that this is breaking down as the market stays resilient in the top towards the top of its balance range. So no red flag here. Obviously, it would be helpful if this starts to retrace some of the breakdown here. We just don't want it leading the market, and it certainly isn't. The XLF is really where the concern starts to step in. Obviously, with the banking crisis happening back here, JP Morgan earnings send us out of this range. Remember that gap up over there? 
this week was pretty interesting with the gap down on the Thursday session, then gap up on the Friday session. We're right at 32.25. To be more comfortable out of the XLF, we've really got to get back above that and stay above it. The concern here is also that this is starting to look like a lower high. And obviously along the way, we have lower lows. It's really not a great look out of financials. Even if you look at something like KRE for the regional bank ETF, right? This had an aggressive breakdown in the previous week's worth of trade. Even a you know rotation higher here keeps a lower high on the table on a retest of the breakdown point at 42 roughly. We'll just call that for round numbers sake. If you look at like the heaviest weighted constituents of the XLF, the only bank that's really hanging in there and, and doing okay right now is JP Morgan. So if this actually starts to break down underneath these lows, let's just say the 50 SMA at this point, if we get back down underneath 134.28, that would definitely be a red flag for this market trying to continue in the upward direction. You would need everything else working in unison to the upside if financials continue to struggle here and tech is really being lackluster. So let's get back on over to the sectors. XLC communications, certainly an opportunity on the daily time frame chart to find some sort of higher low here. I like the bullish engulfer from the Friday session. In a picture perfect world, we rotate back higher towards 60. And that is helpful for the bull case in the market. Obviously, a breakdown underneath the 50 SMA, underneath this key area from the breakout here, that's 56.75, uh, is much more concerning. So keep that as key support on the XLC. Materials, really lightweight sector, neutral in the balance range. Industrials, same idea, a little bit heavier weight. This is 8% of the S&P, but literally smack in the midpoint of the balance range. No real constructive uh, analysis happening there. Same thing could be said about the XLRE for real estate stuck sideways in this balance. It'll be helpful from the wealth effect perspective over 37.45. XLY is where we need to spend a little bit of time because you guys know I've got a bit of an issue with 148, right? Technically, we do have higher lows as we've repeatedly been testing this, but if the market's going to see a more constructive move in the upward direction, really needs to break out over 148. The, you know, the fact that the market has not done this yet, it still does continue to be a red flag. We'll see the weakness in the XLY ratio grid momentarily as well. Pair this with the fact that Amazon is really the biggest driver of earnings so far, or at least reducing the decline in earnings so far for the S&P, and Amazon being the heaviest weighted component of the XLY, this is a bit of a head scratcher, right? You really need 148 to break in the upward direction if the market's going to get in gear to the upside here and see a more substantial break out of the balance range on the daily. XLP consumer staples, this is worth at least noting, uh, you know, if I actually leave this zoomed out for just a moment, the 7750 zone is a big area of resistance. If this starts to break out above that area and the XLK is obviously struggling, that's a major red flag for our market. Keep an eye on 7750 in the XLP. Last but certainly not least, we've got the XLV for the healthcare sector. This one, it's it's being respectful, I would say. It's still stuck kind of in this flag range from a weekly perspective that looks like this. We don't want it leading the pack, but it also can't afford to break down, remembering that it's the second heaviest weighted sector by market cap, but it is a little bit more defensive in terms of posturing. So no red flags out of this one just yet. It would be ideal if the XLK breaks its balance first, and then this one lags in the upward direction. Here's the sector ratio grid to visualize relative strength and weakness, and there's a video tutorial in the top right-hand corner on how to set this one up if you're not familiar. I want to bring us back to reality and just remind you that we're still stuck in a SPY daily balance area. We've talked about higher low pullbacks. We've talked about the higher timeframes like the weekly looking bullish. But for the most part, as we're in the balance area here, I want you to think about the risk on versus risk off posture. Sure, the XLK is technically staying above an upward sloping 50 SMA. The XLV is a little bit more defensive, but we do know it's the second heaviest weighted sector. It's really just going sideways tangled up at the 50 SMA. XLF looks horrible and the XLY is going sideways ways as well. So we don't really have a full-blown risk on look. The closest tie to the XLK might be something like your XLC, and it's pulling back into an upward sloping 50 SMA. It did just make a new higher high in the ratio, so I would watch out for a higher low, but we are not dealing with a full-blown risk on look. I wouldn't be overly confident in a break from the daily balance area until we have a higher low above the daily balance for 16.75, as well as risk on posture in these sectors. If we look at the bottom for. These, of course, are the risk off sectors. These are also not flashing red flags, uh, big warning signs. The XLP, possible double top here rotating in the downward direction. It's not aggressively trending higher. And the same thing can be said about utilities. As a matter of fact, with already a lower high in place, utilities are really more uh, attuned to or akin to risk off posture. So no big flags there. Obviously, energy rotating lower big time in the previous week's worth of trade. Let's take a look at the XLY over the XLP. Again, this is not falling off of a cliff. It's not telling us that we need to duck and cover and that the market needs to crash and burn, but it isn't giving us a warm and 
and fuzzy feeling about a big break in the S&P balance, right? To see this break out in the upward direction, ideally you get a break of this resistance trend line here and a strong recapture over the daily 50 estimate, the gold line on this chart. If I show you something like the weekly time frame chart, you might also notice that we have a longer time frame resistance trend line in play as well. Clearing this would be much more constructive in this ratio. Continuing to stay underneath this 102 level, which represented the bottom of this balance from the original breakdown of 103.50 that invalidated the inverted head and shoulders. It feels like eons ago we were talking about that. But so far, this would actually support the bull case for equities down below, especially if we pair this with what's going on in the GC gold contract here. Notice that as we ran into the FOMC, this did produce a higher high. So from a technical perspective, we're just looking for a higher low. And if the gold contract finds a higher low more firmly this time above 2000, in theory, it puts downward pressure on the dollar, which then again supports the bull case over here in equity. So keeping an eye on that relationship still, let's have a look at our TNX 10-year interest rates. I would just remind you that the more that this can stabilize and go sideways, the more comfortable it is for the market to try to find some sort of trend and direction. It's really interest rate volatility that sends things kind of haywire, right? This and this was a complicating issue for our markets. I would say that with the proposed pause that's coming up from the Fed, no longer hiking interest rates, you would just want to start to monitor, can we actually start to produce some lower highs here on the assumption that rates will start to come down in the future? And in theory, if they're coming down for the right reason, aka inflation is subsiding, the Fed can take its foot off the gas pedal a little bit. If they're moving lower for the right reason, that would in theory be bullish for the XLK tech sector, which is the heaviest weighted component and most risk on component for the equities market, the S&P down below. If rates start falling off aggressively, but for the wrong reasons, because something is breaking, that is always where we get much more fear fearful of the recession indications. The Fed Tracker tool is currently pricing in about a 91.5% probability of a pause in the next Fed meeting, which of course is on June 14th. This comes on the heels of the Fed raising rates on Wednesday, another 25 basis points to achieve a target rate of 500 to 525 basis points, which as we know is well above the core PCE annualized inflation read, the traditional metric used to say, yes, we are at a restrictive enough rate. I would also add on top of that, that in Jerome Powell's press conference, he explicitly said he believes that we are at a restrictive enough rate as well, aka the pause probabilities here do check out as being higher rather than lower. Now, the one concern, of course, as we were just referring to on the TNX chart, is that we want to see rate cuts come in for the right reasons. And the fact that these cuts are being priced in sooner rather than later, remember that we were at November and we were at December of 2023, this does not give me a warm and fuzzy feeling inside about the Fed cutting rates because, hey, inflation's coming down naturally, we can move to a less restrictive monetary policy, this is much more indicative of, hey, something's actually going wrong. We've broken something in the economy. Now, I do think that this is subject to change wildly in the coming week's worth of trade because on Wednesday at 8.30 before the market opens, we will be live on the stream there. We'll be getting the CPI annualized and monthly readings for inflation. And what's not all that uh, thrilling here is the fact that the year over year is scheduled to come in at 5%. That's the forecast, as was the previous monthly read, right? So, not really the best indication that inflation is continuing to subside. It's really all about services inflation. That's that sticky inflation coming down. And uh, so far, maybe the core CPI here has some insights into that with a 0.3 versus last being a 0.4, but we'll see how the data comes out. Just expect the Fed tracker tool to move based on these announcements. Now, as we know, last week on Friday, we got a really, really strong jobs report. The previous jobs report, so not this one from Friday, but the one prior prior to that was actually revised down after some pretty encouraging numbers as well. So keep a lookout to see if they revise these numbers down. But nonetheless, the data we have in hand is a 3.4 versus a 3.6 expected on the unemployment rate. These are 50 year lows, folks. I mean, not indicative whatsoever of a pending recession. We'll see if that changes. But so far, so good. The same thing with the NFP in terms of employment added, right? Uh, the employment change here, 253 versus 181 expected really, really strong numbers on that Friday session. Now, as we know, we have a pretty decent metric over here on Thinkorswim for tracking the unemployment rate and when it becomes an issue. If you load up a 12 simple moving average on a monthly time frame chart for unemployment, so basically a yearly rolling average, when and if we start breaching that in the upward direction, unemployment typically starts to spiral out of control. We all know what this one was back here, but the more uh, you know reasonable one to look at that was not really a black swan event is the great financial crisis, right? As we start 
start spending more time above that 12 SMA, that's where things really start to pick up aggressively in the upward direction. As we're typically trending lower underneath it, not so much of an issue. Here's the dot com burst, of course, right? You can go back and look at this on your own, but so far, once again, the read came in at a 3.4 on the Friday session. The current read of the 12 SMA is a 3.55. So recession, we're not quite there yet unless these numbers are aggressively revised in the upward direction. Here's the earnings calendar for the coming week's worth of trade. Disney and the trade desk strike me as the most important names to watch Wednesday after the close. Other than that, you get some popcorn stocks in here like Palantir and Robinhood, but Disney trade desk, definitely where you want to keep eyes. Let's take a look at the earnings insights from FactSet in the previous week's worth of trade. This paragraph is really substantial, not only because it says the word substantial, but just to reinforce the idea that Apple is the market, the market is Apple. Notice that Apple beats expectations 1.52 versus 1.43 expected, and that is in itself enough to drag the blended earnings of the XLK tech sector from negative 12.6% to negative 10.6%, two whole percentage points just based on Apple alone. It really speaks to the narrow breadth that's keeping this market afloat right now. Uh, this is one of those positive data points. But once again, if Apple starts to tumble, what does that imply? The next page I really want us to take a look at is going to be on page 18. If we scroll on down here, bear with me. Here's 18, and this is consumer discretionary, XLY. We know that we have an issue with 148 on the XLY chart. If the consumer discretion, that's, a, that's an eight here. If the XLY consumer discretionary sector is really outperforming the expectations, just note that the blue bar represents today's in-hand data versus the March 31st expectations. If we're dramatically beating expectations and we're still unable to break the structural element at 148, what would that imply about any sort of decrease in the beat here in expectations or even walking forward, right? It certainly would become more difficult to imagine a breakout there in the discretionary sector if this alone is not enough to push prices outside of that daily balance range. So that's a small cause for concern. Then the last page I want to show you is on page 29, just speaking to the overall returns of 2023 here. If we take a look at this, the actual bottom-up estimates for the S&P in 2023 really unchanged from 2022. So putting our fundamental hat on, this has nothing to do with what we should do on the Monday open if we're a day trader, if we're a swing trader. But from a fundamental perspective, if earnings are really going to drive the growth in the S&P with a lack of earnings growth here, is it reasonable that we really see some chop into the end of 2023? I certainly think so. And if the market does start to rally, you can just make the assumption that it's looking forward to calendar year 2024, where there's clearly a jump in the EPS from companies, right? So overall, a fundamental take for your session today. Checking in on the TLT for our flight to safety trade, what you'll notice is that there's an aggressive pullback that unfolds off of the resistance trend line in the ratio line as the market dramatically outperformed bonds on the Friday session. You would have to imagine if the Fed's about to cut rates aggressively into the back half of 2023, the TLT should be breaking out over 110. It's just not the case as of right now. We'll continue to monitor this resistance trend line in the ratio, but as of right now, there is no clear flight to safety trade unfolding, which is traditionally more bullish for equities down below. If we take a look at something like like the HYG, this has continued to be a red flag for our market, and it still is. Notice that our lower lows in the HYG pair with an equal low out of the equities market here, and the HYG is also really struggling to get back out of this original range, right? There's already a lower high in place here, and there's the potential for a lower high to be in place here. That certainly does not give you confidence in a breakout out of equities if we start testing these equal highs. You would want to be dramatically above 75.65 in the HYG. This is a bearish divergence. Absolutely 100%. Let's take a look at something like the Bitcoin chart to evaluate what's going on in the digital landscape of the golden coin currency. Zooming in on this weekly time frame chart, the bullish hammer here would again suggest bullish activity holding up in a weekly bull flag. And if we were to breach the top of that flag, technically speaking, it is more of a risk on indication. Market breadth gets added to the red flag list in this week's video, noting that new highs versus lows is making an impression underneath the zero line after closing close to it in the previous week's worth of trade, breath continues to deteriorate across the broad market. We could also see similar evidence in something like the SPX A200R making a move underneath the 50% mark for the close in the previous week. And an interesting divergence, if we take a look at the SPX A50R, and this is now a daily time frame chart here, let's just point out that we have a higher low happening here on the SPX A50R. 
as we get in the S&P market, an equal low. So what would that tell you across the broad market? Well, as this pullback was unfolding, some companies were actually staying resilient out there. So we have conflicting signals between the breaths. When it comes to these types of indications, I tend to favor the higher timeframes. So the deterioration out of new highs and lows, as well as the SPX A200R, strike me as more substantial. But this is just one data point to carry forward in our analysis, which is noteworthy. Let's take a look at the RSP. This is the equal weight S&P up at the top, obviously nowhere even close to an equal high break, whereas the S&Ps are sitting right on that level. This is a big red flag as well. This is a bearish divergence. And the same thing can be said about the Dow transports. Once again, this, a little bit of a higher low happening in transports, nowhere near the breakout point, but this is a lower low up here in industrial. So a little bit of recovery out of transports would be helpful, but you really just want to see both of these red lines break in sync when and if that happens, that would be helpful. If one breaks without the support of the other, that is much more of that red flag situation. Taking a look at VIX volatility, it's a aggressively backing down off of 2050, a known area of support, you would have to think if Jerome Powell was going to come out and say something that completely broke markets and was going to send this thing uh, to hell in a handbasket, VIX would have been spiking over 2050. We would not have found resistance there. And even if you bring up the argument that short dated options are skewing the volatility index, we can look at the VIX. And although it's certainly elevated, notice the big upper wick around 103 rejecting these higher prices in the VIX, the volatility of the volatility index. We can take it one step further with our VIX futures, and this is the updated contract up at the top, moving deeper into a contango here, well underneath the zero line, as is the short dated VIX, right? So the nine versus 30 day VIX, if you're a believer in the skew from options, it's still underneath the zero line here, indicating for market participants that, hey, there's more unknown risk in the future than there is in the present day. Now is a perfectly fine time to be allocating capital. The one day VIX still does not have enough data down below, but excited to start tracking that one. Rounding out the broad market with the QQQ on the weekly time frame chart, and then we'll get more nuanced here. We are dealing with a hammer candle, just like the S&Ps, but obviously this has a green body on it. So we were able to recapture the opening print and close up towards the highs of the weekly range. And we were also able to close above the top of this weekly bull flag from right around in here. It strikes me as being really noteworthy that the queues looked back into the range. That's what the lower wick represents. And then the buyer stepped back up. Of course, if we're thinking about the larger time frame trend, of course, we have higher lows in play as well as higher highs being produced. And this could be the start of a weekly bull flag breakout. The target, of course, would be this prior weekly pivot just north of 330. I also want to remind you on the QQQ that if we bring in our anchored view app from the all time high, that's going to be the upper anchored view app. We do use the lower wick and find support at that anchored view app. Once again, more of a bullish indication here. If we throw on the volume profile in the QQQ, I also want to point out that a break from this bull flag on the weekly time frame represents a huge break of a massive high volume node from a volume perspective, right? Look at how little volume there is at some of these upper pivot points on the QQQ. Once again, it's not an assumption that we're going here into the coming weeks worth of trade. It just speaks to the lack of volume resistance overhead and the fact that the Q should travel with relative ease in the upward direction versus the downward direction where we've clearly formed some sort of base here on the higher time frames. Let's move on down to a daily time frame chart to evaluate the weekly expected move and our levels as we navigate into the coming weeks worth of trade. If we zoom in here and take a look at our expected move, the first indication is that yes, this is also implying a higher high above the top of the previous weekly high and also a higher low above the bottom of the Thursday session from last week. The numbers there are 316.67 and 329.16. So what should we expect here? If this is the original balance range in the QQQ, obviously we've broken above and we're also dealing with a higher low already in place from here to here. We've got equal highs in place from here to here. So I would start to think that it's more fair to assume uh, that the Qs are starting to build out a new uptrend, of course, with the equal highs and the higher low. A breach of 323.25 brings us to our next structural element at 326.25 and the upper edge of the weekly expected move, as we just pointed out, 320. 2916. In a picture perfect world, bulls would either produce continuation or some sort of higher low above the top of the original range at 32050. That is also a bullish indication here. Technically speaking, the buyers could even afford for a deeper pullback into 318 on the daily time frame chart for something that starts to look like this as daily higher lows. Let's move on down to the hourly time frame chart and get a little bit more nuanced. Once again, if this was going to act as the lower high on the hourly chart 
as the market was breaking down on the Thursday session, why was it that on Friday, there is no gap in the QQQ, but we squeeze in the upward direction and then see new money buyers continue to push in the upward direction towards the close. If we take a look at market internals, once again, the, the argument's quite clear here, right? Higher lows on the hourly time frame chart, higher lows on the daily time frame chart. There are shorts to be had, don't get me wrong, on something that does this, that is scalpable in the downward direction, but really shouldn't overstay your welcome on the short side here in the QQQ. Once again, I want to illustrate with our market internals that we have squeeze and then new money buyers into the close here. Here are the QQQ internals. What you'll notice is that the outflows were not as significant as what we saw. Oops, this is the NICE. What am I saying here? So notice the NICE, right? Sitting right around negative 500 million, right? If we go over to the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ in terms of internals, not even close to negative 500 million, about half that and negative 250 million cumulatively on the week. Really solid reads on the Friday session there. Uh, solid reads out of the advanced decline line. All of that stuff remains the same. And once again, the illustration is that the tick, the cumulative tick, continues to build into the close. It's not just a sharp recovery, short squeeze in the morning, and then a flat line into the close. Obviously, we see that continued and sustained buying across the exchange on the day of Friday. Let's take a look at our market profile here for the QQQ. And once again, we want to compare towards the spike from the Wednesday session. Notice that on Thursday, there's actually more overlap with the spike. The SPY obviously had no overlap. So the Qs, not as much damage done on the Thursday session. There you go. There's your short squeeze in the upward direction. Then new money buyers bring this thing into the close. Once again, the point of control, it didn't migrate and close the strongest as it could have, but for all intents and purposes, it's well above the spike, the uh, the top of the spike here from the Wednesday session, which does strike me as a more bullish than bearish data point. Once again, if we just go back on over to thinkorswim, I think that the argument could be made that we are looking for some sort of higher low above 320.50 on a pullback, retrace, tag up to that point of control, then look for continuation over 320.325. Here is the IWM Russell 2000 and the small caps on a weekly time frame chart. And of course, just remember that small caps typically act as a proxy for risk on versus risk off. And although we're dealing with a hammer candle, it's a red bodied hammer on the weekly time frame chart, we're just sitting in this balance range and will become much more constructive when and if we can break the highs or when and if we can break the lows in terms of finding a weekly trend here. It is worth pointing out that this is sitting in much more of a weekly bear flag as opposed to the weekly bull flag that we were just looking at in the QQ. Q, really a red flag for the markets, no pun intended, considering, again, the risk on versus risk off nature of small caps as a whole. You really want to see this break the top of the balance range closer to 180 if it's going to be more constructive for a broad based market recovery. And the idea would be that we recapture the top of the banking crisis candle high much closer to roughly 191, 192 in the IWM. Just as a general reminder, we're nowhere near the critical anchored view app that we are in the QQQ or even the SPY right? The all-time high anchored view app, it's not even a thought in the mind of the IWM at this point in time. The October low anchored view app is still putting downward pressure on small caps here. Once again, that does stack up as a bearish data point. Something a little bit more encouraging is looking at something like the volume profile here in the IWM. We are sitting on very strong uh, volume support. Just look at the size of these high volume nodes. And of course, a breach of the top of that weekly range we were just talking about, 180 to the upside, does open the door. Once again, not calling for this all than one week's worth of trade, but it's more constructive that we would move towards the top of the banking crisis candle high. That's the next major high volume node that we would have to contend with. You can see the void that's produced in this general area here. Let's move on down to a daily time frame chart and get a little bit more granular with our analysis for what we can expect in the coming week's worth of trade. Once again, expected move here does strike me as being more neutral out of the IWM. Even if we do rotate to the top of the expected move, the number is going to be right around 179 even. It's just an equal high keeping us in that weekly balance range we were just looking at. The lower edge, of course, is just an equal low at the lows of the weekly balance range. So nothing all that insightful from an expected move perspective. Instead, I would really encourage you to keep an eye on 175.75. Reason being is that that represents the bottom of this micro balance. And we already know that we had a break, retest, and lower high push away. Ideally, for the bears to remain in control of the IWM, we produce another lower high underneath 175.75 to come and close this gap underneath us and attempt to break from the balance range in the downward direction. If we start to get price acceptance above 175.75 for something that does this, you could start to imagine that this perhaps is a double bottom neckline recapture. All of a sudden, the tables have turned and we'll expect a rotation to the top of the weekly balance range where things look much more interesting for a break up and over 179.
this point in the video, I'm sure you're enjoying the analysis. Hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel so you know every single time a new video comes out. And with that, we will dive right into Apple, just pointing out that this support trend line held on the Thursday gap down. And obviously Friday was a big gap up from the earnings announcement. So pretty obvious watches here going forward. Number one is that higher low pullbacks want to remain above 170.50, above the low of the Friday session. This of course builds out a balance range and then we'll look for a break or continuation over 174.75 to start to target 179 on the upside. Anything underneath Friday's low, very simply put, is looking for a gap to close down at 167 even. So fairly straightforward out of Apple. Obviously, the trend here is clearly in the upward direction. Let's take a look at Netflix. What's going on in Netflix? Really stuck in the balance range. Nothing all that insightful out of Netflix. It's more constructive underneath 317.75 with a lower high. That is certainly tradable in the downward direction. Or you could start to look for day trade scalps if we can get out of these inside bars. If we go to something like an hourly time frame chart here and zoom in on Netflix, you'll notice how it's really coiled up tight. If we start to get a break, perhaps over 324, you could start to look to trade this in the upward direction. These are day trade scalps, right? 327 comes into view. Then after that, the top of the daily balance at 332.50, obviously longs who want a more constructive or a move with potentially more follow through would want to see a break over 332.50 and then some sort of higher lows to continue into these highs at 348.50. Next up is going to be Tesla breaking out from that inverted head and shoulders on the Friday session. This does look really solid to continue through the gap range here in the upward direction from earnings. That's 177.65. This would be a massive help for that dastardly sector, the XLY over here, breaking out over 148 in the upward direction. If Tesla can continue through this gap range and we can also see Amazon hold up resiliently, that would be a huge bullish force for the market. So keep an eye on Tesla over 167.20, obviously higher lows, just want to hold above 165, the breakout point from that right shoulder. If we fall back down underneath, we will reevaluate. Next up is Google. What's going on over here? Very similar to Netflix. Not much to really say. We're stuck in a balance range, constructive on lower highs underneath 103.75 for shorts, or better longs are just going to be patient up and over 108.75. There's perhaps an idea for a higher low intraday over 106.50 to get to the top of the range, but once again, that is a scalp only. Let's take a look at something like Meta, Metaverse and Zucchini Berg's Fantasyland here, continuing to break down, getting into the gap, but providing an indecisive doji on the Friday session, obviously, as the market rallied there, doesn't really look at like it wants to break down substantially. I would just keep an eye on 236.75 out of Meta. Any lower highs underneath, keep in play a breakdown from the earnings gap up range. That, of course, would provide a lower high on the daily time frame chart. And from there, we'll look to see if we can get uh, a continuation of this gap to close. But so far, kind of a patience play. I wouldn't really look to long this into that area either. The better long, obviously, is some sort of higher low to build out, a pie in the sky, inverted head and shoulders, then back up and over the neckline 241. And the reason being, of course, is because of the fake break that happened here early on in last week's trading session. Next up, let's take a look at Nivda. Earnings are off in no man's land. These are not yet a concern, but for the most part, really liking the idea that this balance range is starting to move more constructively in the upward direction with a higher low being produced on Thursday and a bullish engulfer, right? Look at how many days this recaptures on the Friday session, right? We have Wednesday, Thursday, or excuse me, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, breaking down in NVIDIA just to be recaptured in one bullish day on Friday, producing an equal high up here at the top over 287.75. Our next overhead target is quite a ways away at 307 right? So please be responsible about this one. Equal high breaks are on the table, but ideally it's something that looks like this into the future as well. Higher lows over 287.75. To be bearish on NVIDIA, it's got to be a lower high evidence uh, or proof, I should say, lower high proof under 280. We're not there yet. Next up, we've got Microsoft, another titan in the uh, XLK as a sector whole. What I wanted to point out here with this orange dotted line is this is where the open AI partnership was really announced. Notice how much Microsoft has run here. If we're expecting a pretty rough quarter, you know, in Q2 and possibly Q3 of 2023 here, and then looking for optimism in 2024, I mean, Microsoft has done quite a bit of work to keep the S&Ps afloat. Once again, we talk about the narrow market breadth that's supporting this rally. If Microsoft just consolidates up here now that earnings are in the rearview mirror, you know, what does that mean? It means that the rest of the market really has to pick up the slack. Sure, it's starting to break out of a bull flag, but I mean, 
you know, you, you never want to just short things because they're quote unquote too high, but you have to start thinking just like NVIDIA was a runaway train, you know, where does this thing start to base out? Where is the next balance area that forms? That's just one consideration out of Microsoft. Anyways, with the break on Friday session, constructive on higher lows over 309, only bearish on Microsoft for a pullback if we can get lower high evidence under 304.25. Otherwise, there's just no reason whatsoever to be shorting something that has so much strength behind it. Last but certainly not least is the mini beast. This is Amazon, the other key component of the XLY, really chopping around in the two bar range from Wednesday, Thursday. Friday builds it out as a three bar range now. And obviously the break is over 105.50, target 108, or underneath the lows, 103.50, target 101.25. Simple as that. I would take it day by day out of Amazon. This has really proven to be a sloppy and choppy area. One final reminder to hit the thumbs up button, the subscribe button, the bell button, all that good stuff YouTube tells us to tell you about. Let's jump right into these trade ideas. First one is on MGM. And what you'll notice here is all of these equal lows. But on the Friday session, we produced an inside bar. So if the broad market is falling apart early on in the coming week's worth of trade, we're looking for short ideas underneath 42.65 to start to target 40.45. Now, one thing that you should obviously note here about MGM is that the Y axis really isn't all that large. This is not going to be a day trade. Perhaps this could unfold as as a swing with some sort of spread in MGM. That also begs the question, I'm not entirely sure what the liquidity looks like on the options chain. Make sure you check it out before just jumping into this. But structurally, the setup does make sense. The next one is going to be on MRK. This is, of course, Merck, definitely a more liquid options chain here. And the idea is that we have two back-to-back -back hammers on a retest of this breakout area here. So a break, retest, looking for longs over those hammer highs as day trade scalps up towards 119.65, the equal high on the daily time frame chart. That trade is fairly straightforward. Next up is going to be Uber. Once again, Uber's price point is not really all that attractive unless you want to do this with some sort of spread, but the structure does make sense here. If we're looking for a breakout in the upward direction, there's really a lot of room to run in the upward direction. 42.22 is the next weekly time frame target. After earnings sent this thing on a big run in the upward direction, nice little phase of consolidation here with inside bars on Thursday and Friday, really resilient as the market was breaking down during that portion of the week. So the trade is a long over over 38 to see if we can get some upward continuation. If you just want to scalp it, I wouldn't blame you either. Noting that we are fairly extended here, you may not want to overstay your welcome on the long side of that trade. Last but not least is going to be DDOG for Datadog. If I could spell here DDOG, there we are. And what we'll see here is an inverted hammer shooting star on the Friday session looking for a pullback, but then to catch it for support at 72.81 on the retest of this breakout level, right? You're basically looking for a break retest high or low, and then some sort of continuation. Once again, you would first target the equal high, probably closer to 77.50, but this is definitely a trade worth watching out for here inside of Datadog underneath. So pull back first, inverted hammer low, look for some sort of sign of a reversal at 72.81, and then swing back for the equal high back in this general area. That's all I've got for you in today's episode of the weekly watch list. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything new, let me know by leaving the video a comment down below or a simple thumbs up it goes a long way as well. And with that said, I hope to see you in the pre-market live 815 on the Monday session. And I wish all of you a green trading week.